All right, let's talk about the technical requirements of a proposal. See what says, be very careful. Well, be very, 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 very careful. You can be technically disqualified. You can have a beautiful proposal, be the most qualified or overqualified person to become the local listing broker for HUD. And if you screw up the technical requirements of the proposal, you're disqualified anyway. So read the instructions. And our expression here, and what we always use with our staff is RFI. You can put whatever word you want in there for the middle letter. Okay, but read the instructions carefully. Length, how many pages you're allowed to submit. Don't go over. Required topics. They're going to have a list of requests of questions or items or exhibits. Don't miss any of them on the topics of exhibits. Watch fonts. Some of them will be very specific, like must be in a 12-point Times Roman or Helvetica font. Be very careful. They actually put this stuff in these requests, and you have to have them there. Because they don't want you submitting, you know, fitting their 30 pages in with the font so small that nobody can read it just because you have so much extra information in there. So watch that. Watch your margins as well. Specific instructions. This is where they get you. Now, I'm not going to swear this is gospel and this is how they think, but it certainly appears to be the way it works. If you win an area or a couple of areas and you've got to hire these brokers and you know that every broker is going to apply and even agents will apply who technically aren't even eligible. You can't apply unless you have the NAID number. Only the person with the NAID number can apply and a NAID number only goes to the broker owner. Okay, it does not belong to an agent. So agents can't really apply, but they do anyway. So do you really want to go through 10,000 proposals and try and read them and sort them? Or are you going to look for ways to eliminate them? Very important. We've seen all sorts of stuff on this. It's just the way it works. So specific instructions, be very careful there. These are your traps. Again, massive amount of applications. Every broker will be applying. No one wants to read five, 10,000 proposals. So they're looking for ways to eliminate as many as possible so they don't have to go through them all. They can't interview 5,000 people. They're also trying to eliminate any protest or complaints, meaning that broker applies, gets turned down, so they file a complaint, they call their congressman, Okay, congressional complaints are a real big deal with HUD contracts, They're known as congressionals. Um, so they want to make sure that if they turn you down, they have a very good reason to, so you can't file a complaint or protest it. Very important to understand. Again, they want to eliminate you. And it's not that they're looking to eliminate you if you're the best broker, but they're just trying to cut down the number of applications and the ones they have to go through and who they have to interview. It's just, it's a horrible process. I feel bad for them. But some of the tricks that we've seen Delivery method, very specific. If you're to send your proposal via email, they'll usually have a very specific subject line in the email. If you miss the subject line or have it wrong, you're disqualified. Um, we saw this done once years ago on the outside of the envelope because sometimes your proposals will be mailed or hard copied in. So on the outside of the envelope, one m and contractor requested the name of the county that you were in on the outside of your envelope. So if you sent this proposal and it didn't have your county that you're located in on the outside, circular file thrown away. It was eliminated. Very short timelines. This is what screws everybody up. When the HUD M&M contracts are announced and the awards are made to the new M&Ms, they will immediately request proposals from the LLBs, local listing brokers. That's you as the broker. They will only have a short window, seven to 10 days max because this eliminates a lot of people being able to even respond. It happens very quickly. So whenever that happens, be prepared to clear two days and get all this stuff done. So a lot of folks miss the deadline. Um, strange questions might be on the proposal. We've seen this. One of my favorites was favorite motivational author and speaker. That was actually on the application and had to be part of your proposal. You'll get to see all sorts of strange things. Understand the game. You must have a technically compliant proposal with all the information in a timely manner very quickly and you must follow directions exactly. Read the directions three or four times, write out a checklist for all the directions, then have two or three other people read the instructions or directions and help you with it. You always want a second or third pair of eyes on this. You miss any one of them, you're disqualified. That's the biggest thing I've seen that probably puts 90% of the people out that otherwise would be qualified is they don't read the instructions and they don't follow directions exactly. Okay, on those, space requirements. Use your allotments very wisely. 
There's going to be page counts, margins, fonts. Now, graphs and charts don't count as far as mm, information requirements, but graphs and charts are a way to communicate a tremendous amount of information in a very small space. You've heard a picture is worth a thousand words and a proposal that's even more true than ever. You may not have room to put in three or four paragraphs about your company's market share and its history and everything else, but a small graph will fit right in and graphs don't become part of the word count typically. Now, sometimes they are part of the page count, and sometimes they're not. So sometimes, if you're limited to 30 pages, you can still attach 10 pages of exhibits. You have to read it. It's very, read it very carefully. It's different each time. But typically, they don't count, and you can get so much information in a picture or a chart or a graph. So make sure you have some. And are required forms part of the space allotment? Very important that you read that. I've seen a lot of people screw this up, that the page allotment was 30 pages for all proposal length. But 10 of those pages were required forms from the M&M. &M. And those could be W-9s, different um, certifications they want to see, um, affidavits they ask you to sign and notarize that, that can be part of it, uh, agreement to participate and with fair housing, an agreement to participate or abide by certain laws, all sorts of strange things can be put in there. You have to see if they're part of the page limit or they're not. Sometimes it's 30 pages plus exhibits. Sometimes it's 30 pages with exhibits with required forms. So if you misread that and you write 30 beautiful pages, then you send them 10 pages of their own required forms, you're actually over the limit. Really careful there. All right, let's talk about the interview. This assumes you did a phenomenal proposal. You had all your information there. You got it in on time. You submitted it correctly. You read the instructions and had a technically perfect proposal to get through. You get to the interview stage. Maybe one out of 21, out of 25, even 30, get to the interview stage. It's usually 3 to 5% of the people who apply to be local listing brokers and get HUD listings from the m and actually make it to the interview stage. So if you made it this far, you've done phenomenal, better than 95, 98% of the other people applying. This is where you know you have it if you don't screw this up. The interview is very important. One of the first things you need to watch is avoid bad words. Foreclosure and REO. Very bad words when it comes to HUD. HUD is not foreclosures, they are government-owned homes. And if you understand the process of how the banks actually foreclose, then they reconvey the property to HUD. HUD literally buys the foreclosure back. It's not a foreclosure, and it wasn't in their mind. It's a government-owned home. Again, practice those words, government-owned home, government-owned home, whenever you're selling these, whenever you're talking about them. Very important. Another thing is understand that this is not about money. HUD and FHA, all of it tied together, is a social engineering project. It's about getting more people into homes, creating more new homeowners, stabilizing neighborhoods, saving neighborhoods. All of those things are what you should be talking about, not how much money you're going to get for them and that you'll get better prices, because it's really not about that. Again, anything about new homeowners, talk about community outreach, new homebuyer programs, seminars you've done marketing you're going to do, all about those things. One of the other things I want to tell you about the interview is make sure you've read your own proposal 15 or 20 times and you have it memorized because they're going to read that proposal and ask you, yeah, I see your marketing plan. What are you doing there? They're going to read it and you better be able to repeat back to them everything you promised you were going to do for them. Very important. Dress professional, behave professional. Okay, very important. Watch the language, watch the mannerisms. Treat it as a job interview because that's what it is. It is a job interview. Also, show a sincere desire to help people become homeowners. That's the most important part of this. Now, the other thing I've seen people blow their interviews on. Don't be a critic. Do not badmouth anyone, especially the process about how HUD works, our government, past brokers, past M&Ms. Don't say, well, the last M&M did that and it was horrible and they were stupid. Or, you know, the brokers they used were idiots. Stay away from that. Don't criticize any of it. These are the people you are going to get paid by and get listings from. This is how you're going to make money. Do not be critical. Okay? If they ask you specifically, what do you think the way it was done? Don't criticize how it was done. Say, well, I would have liked to seen it done like this. Or I think it could have been done this way. And I think this would have been more successful. Or I like this idea. Do not be critical. Just talk about what you're going to do. Very careful. The other thing is be very familiar with all the FHA and other first-time buyer loan programs. You're there to create new homeowners, first-time buyers, stabilized neighborhoods, 
Know what? Know the FHA loans. Know the difference between a 203K and a 203B. Know about if there's a hard, an EMI, an ACORN, or any type of grant program active in your area right now. I know those are old terms, but there are grant programs out there. Be familiar with all the ways to get somebody into a home, especially someone who's never owned a home before. Talk about perpetual renters and how you'd like to see that changed and ways you have to reach out. Maybe you're going to be marketing to large apartment complexes to find buyers, things along those lines, but be familiar with all of it. These are the type of questions you'll get. Okay, showing experience, also very important. If you've never sold a HUD home before and you've never had a NAID number before and you're going to go in there and say, I'm the best person for you, and they're going to say, you've never sold a HUD home. Okay, the number of HUD homes that have been sold on a NAID number can be tracked. So one of the things that you should be doing right now or should have started a year ago was selling as many HUD homes as possible that show up on your NAID number. In other words, don't say, hey, I'm going to list HUD homes because I'm a great person. Say, you know what? I've sold 60 HUD homes over the last three years. I know the process. I know how it works. I believe in the process. Check my NAID number. Here it is. I'd be showing as selling as many HUD homes as possible right now to show that on your NAID numbers. Um, outreach and education is huge. You should start holding seminars and other educational events now. Don't just put it in your proposal that you will do this. Everybody claims they're going to do everything under the sun. I would say, here's what we've done. These are the seminars. I held three buyer seminars last quarter. We do one once a month. I just did this huge thing with the church group, and we blah, blah, blah. Do it now. Show them you're doing it. Don't say you're going to do it later. Okay? And keep in mind, it's both to consumers and to agents. What have you done to bring more buyers and create more new homeowners with HUD? Also, what have you done to bring all the other agents in to help them sell more HUD properties? Just as important. The whole goal is creation of new first-time home buyers. Also, increasing the number of brokers who have NAID numbers, because if the broker has a NAID number, then his agents or her agents can sell HUD homes. So you want to get more offices with more NAID numbers, bringing more agents and get more of them involved in selling HUD homes. So I would have a plan for agent broker training to help brokers get NAID numbers, understand the HUD process, and get more of them and their agents involved. Going on to outreach and education, I just said this over and over, start doing it now. Document, photograph, post on the internet, social media, show that you're already doing these things. That's what they want to see is outreach. Don't say you're going to do outreach, be doing it. I mean, obviously have your outreach plan as part of your marketing plan, your community outreach, your education programs, but then say, hey, I've already done it. I would have a picture of you in front of you know 50 agents or 50 homeowners or potential homeowners teaching a class. So, yeah, we're already doing that. Okay, start doing it now before the proposal comes up. A little more on outreach and education, affiliations. If you can get letters from different groups you've worked with, nonprofits, faith-based, which is the political term for a religious organization, you want to call them faith-based, that you've done seminars with this church group or that synagogue or that nonprofit, working with local government agencies, you've worked with your local HUD office, you've done an event with them. I mean, offer to host an event, offer to hold a fundraiser, run educational classes. Not only put it in your proposal, but be already doing it and show what you've done. That's huge. Everybody says they're going to do everything under the sun in their proposals. If you could show that you're actually already doing it, you're way ahead of everyone else. Wrapping up on education and outreach, you want to build relationships. And that's what the faith-based, local government agencies and nonprofits have those relationships in place. Get testimonials from them. If you're allowed to, and a lot of times in the proposals, you can add exhibits at the end of them, testimonial letters about how you've worked with this group, how you've helped so many people get new homes, or how you taught this class. Letters of recommendation are great. Pictures are worth more than anything else. A picture is worth a thousand words, 10,000 words. We talked about graphs, charts, and pictures. Photos of your classes, your events, your fundraisers. Maybe a group of people that you've gotten into new homes. I mean, you have 10 or 12 people or 10 or 12 couples, whatever it works out to be that you sold homes to and they were first-time homebuyers. Put them in there. Hell, I'd throw a little party for them and just so I can get the photo. It'd be worth it. These are the type of things you can do. The more you can show them, the better. So, again, document all of this. Be doing it now. Have a plan to do more and show it. Last thing I'm going to leave you with on this, and I really want you to think in these terms, the HUD proposal and trying to become a local listing broker is like a term paper. It is a lot of work 
And it's like a term paper because you need a couple of months to do it, just like a term paper in school. However, becoming a local listing broker for HUD is a tremendous amount of guaranteed listing inventory, very high volume. The amount of work you do is not that difficult. It's actually an easy contract to run. You get paid very well. It's well worth it. I mean, can you invest a couple of months of your time and probably 100, 150 hours to put all this together to make a couple hundred grand a year for the next five years? It's a no brainer, but you have to start now. So I want you to think of this as a term paper, long term. You do have a few months to complete it still. It will be 80, 120, 150 hours. What I would suggest is you take each one of the topics I mentioned, break it up into small pieces. Uh, a couple hours a day or a couple hours each week, work on each topic and have it ready to go. Uh, a lot of the stuff you write, write it up in Word documents so you can edit it on the fly because you may write it one way and have 90% of it, but the way the M&M requests it and their RFP, you may have to tweak it a little bit. But the point is get started now. Work on all of these things, have it all put together and ready to go. So when the M&M's contracts are awarded and then they put out the RFP for the brokers, meaning you, you have everything at your fingertips to put it together. And even then it'll take you two days. So, and it will happen quickly. So get started now. This can be one of the best contracts there is. I was very fortunate to have one of the largest ones in the country under M&M1, and it was about 2,400 a year. Can you imagine getting that, that amount of listings a year? It was a hell of a contract. I made a ton of money, had a great time doing it. But that's how important this is. So treat it with that kind of priority, but get started now.